we're going to start in D365 and batch setup. Uh, batch jobs are something that, as uh, I'm sure every sysadmin has had to touch it in some way, shape, or form. So we're going to look first at some of the different setup and then the monitoring. So if you are having issue, any issues with batch contention or batch jobs that are um, that are earring out or not um, running as quickly as you would like or um, having issues in that way, one of the things I would suggest you look into is something called batch auto scaling. It's something that Microsoft has implemented for all of us because all of us by now should be on 10.0.39 or 38. And so we all have this. This is Microsoft's way of saying, okay, given all the different batch jobs that this client has, and the number of batch AOSs we've given you, how do we prioritize? When do we scale up? When do we scale down? How do we make sure that you have enough resources to run those batch jobs that you're um, in your system? And so if you're having any issues, I would definitely look into the documentation around that or reach out to Stone Ridge so that we can help you in that area. The other thing is the batch priority based scheduling. This is something that's newer. It's been around for a little while and as of 10.0.38, we all have to or get to use it. And this is a way where you can set the priority for your batch jobs. Um, we used to have something similar with batch groups, but this is a little more robust. And we all know that batch jobs do actually have different priorities, right? We have some where it's not the end of the world if they run on time or not. But there are others that it's important that they run on time and that they complete within a timely manner. And so Microsoft has given us a different, a list of different priorities from low all the way to reserved capacity. Reserved capacity is where you will get the most amount of resources for that particular batch job. And this is a way to say, hey, I need more AOS resources to be dedicated to this batch job so it completes in a timely manner. Um, so if you have things like invoicing or MRP or thing, other processes that are important, you should look at this so that you can make sure it gets the resources that it needs. The other thing that we should look at or we can look at is active batch periods. This is a feature that allows you to say, I want to tell batch jobs that they can only run during a certain period. And I like to give the example of work hours. So, you know, most, if you're not a 24 by seven company, you might just be working or have people in the system from let's say seven to seven. And during that time, you do want people to get their workflow messages, but you don't need people to be getting alerts or notices during the night. And so you can say for, example, on a workflow batch job that it only runs during that active period. So you would set up your active period and then you would go into that batch job and say, hey, I only want this to run during work hours. And that's a way to, again, decrease the amount of load on those AOS servers, especially at night when you might be running things like invoicing or MRP. And the last thing I'll talk about with batch jobs is monitoring them. And one of the things that I'll do during this session is often refer to, you might want to make an Outlook reminder for yourself or set a task in your calendar or a reoccurring event. And one of the things, whether it's once a week, you know, twice, a, you know, every other week, once a month, go in and look at those batch jobs that are failing. So go into your batch jobs, look at the status of error, you know, filter or sort it by the date, and then look at what's erroring. Look at the batch job history and the log and see why they might be erroring. Look for any patterns in batch jobs that are failing and when they're failing. And some of this and some of what I'm going to be recommending is ways in which you can get ahead of maybe some big issues within your system and stay ahead of those support calls or help desk calls that you might get. Next, we want to look at data cleanup jobs. So as we move to the Power Platform Admin Center and having to monitor our capacity, one of the things we want to do is make sure that we're cleaning up data within the system. And Microsoft has an article where they talk about all of the different data cleanup jobs that they have. 
and I'm going to focus on the system areas, but there are um, recommendations for other areas of the software, and I would suggest that you <clears throat> work with your subject matter experts and departments on those areas to see which ones you might want to implement. As far as a system cleanup, I recommend that you go through and run or go and run your batch job cleanup and the batch job history cleanup. I usually suggest that we pick the custom option because it gives us a little more flexibility in how we can run these. Um, if it is your first time running this, there's especially some things you want to make sure that you do. So when you come into this form, you can say, you know, how long do you want to be able to keep your batch job history? You know, is it 30 days? Can it be two weeks? And think through some of that. And if there's some where you need to keep them for longer, you know, you can make some adjustments to the parameters here so you can make some of those modifications. The other thing is you could say, I want to start by just deleting everything that errored or everything that finished, or everything that canceled. If you're doing this for the first time, or you have a lot of data, I would definitely recommend that in the records to delete in a transaction, you not leave that zero so that it will just do everything. You'll want to do a subset of records at a time, because if you have 45 million records in there and you try to run this, that could cause a high load on your system and we don't want that. We we want this to run easy, easily and without much impact on your system. We don't want to cause other batch jobs to be held up. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. As far as other cleanup, it depends on what you're using in the system. So if you're using alerts, think through how long you need to keep alerts and when you can um, get rid of those workflows how long do you need those notifications and then the last one is database logging that's the one you probably need to retain the longest um, but all of these have different time frames and are things if you're using them that you should think about how to clean those up and work with the different teams that have set those up to see what their retention policy needs to be the last thing that we'll talk about is data management. So if you're importing data, by default, Microsoft will delete your tables after 90 data in those tables after 90 days. But for some of you, if you're importing a lot of data, you could get to quite a sizable amount of data even within 90 days. And so you might want to come in and say, we're going to um, purge data after seven days or 14 days or 30 days to keep that um, size down to a manageable level and the, but also keep things that are important so that you can go back and look if there were any issues. The thing to note on here is unlike the previous where you do um, the number of records you want to delete at a time, this is sets a limit on how long you want the job to run before it ends. So it's just something different. So, you know, two would mean you want it to run for two hours. And so just think through that. Um, I wouldn't probably go much more than two hours. Next, we're going to talk about how you go about removing users. And so one of the things to think about here is, do you have a process in place to remove users from your system? So you know, we know that people leave the company or they move to a different department and no longer need to get into D365. So you've, have you thought through what that looks like? How, how are you removing them from the system? Some things to consider when you're removing them are, you know, are they tied to a batch job? Do you need to reassign that batch job to someone else? Do they have alerts tied to them? If so, do those need to be you know, transferred to someone else, can they just be deleted? And then are they part of workflows and does that need to be cleaned up? So it's really a good idea to just look and think through how am I going to remove users? Because I know that um, we have systems where I, I see it. I go in and in the user list, I see people who are no longer with the company or even with Stone Ridge, you know, you add your consultants, but after they're no longer part of your project, we're not going back and cleaning those people up. And the other thing to think about with users is what environments do they need to have access in? 
Do they need access in production, your non-production, your development environments? Do they only need access in one specific environment? And make sure that you're only giving them access to the environments they need. And one little hack that I'll give you is there's some people like support who they don't probably need access to your production. They need access to your UAT or your dev environment. And so for those people, you might set them up in production, but then you disable them so that when we refresh data in other environments, it's easier to enable those users and not have to reset them up or set them up. The last thing in D365 that we'll talk about is the fact that Microsoft is deprecating the Exchange email provider, and they're going with something called Microsoft Graph. And with Microsoft Graph, we have to go into the Azure portal and create an application ID for that and specify that we're using Microsoft Graph and give permissions to that. And there's a whole article that tells you how to do that. And then um, once that is set up, we have to come back into D365 and go into this Microsoft Graph settings, set the application ID, and as part of setting up the application ID, you create a certificate, so you have to enter in that secret. Um, let's move on to LCS. So what are some of the things that we should be doing in LCS? One of the things, if you haven't had to do this yet, it's coming, is with our cloud-hosted environments, they all have SSL certs. Um, Dynamics 365 uses IAS, so we have um, certificates for those, and we need to rotate those or refresh them. They're good for one year, so um, what you'll want to do or what I suggest doing is it's one year from when you deploy the box or from when you rotate them. So what you'll want to do is set a reminder in your calendar, you know, whether that's Outlook or your phone or somewhere, so that about 50-ish weeks from when you do this, you have a task that comes up that, that reminds you, hey, go rotate the secrets for dev box one or whatever it's called. And that way, um, you don't run into an issue where the cert is expired in the middle of trying to do a service update or do a code fix. And so that's one thing that you can be doing proactively in your system. The other thing is to clean up items in your asset library, um, especially under the software deployable package section. Many of us who are in LCS and deploy code we know that when we go to deploy code, it can take quite a while for that page to come up with all the different options for us. And that's because some of us have maybe five years of history of deployable packages. And so one thing that we can do to help ourselves and Microsoft is go out and delete some of those old deployable packages. If you need to retain data, um, maybe you have those deployable packages somewhere else on your network, but not on LCS. The other thing that a lot of us as system admins are doing is we are refreshing our data. And so one of the things that um, I recommend is that we automate that process as much as possible. And so we want to go and say, where are the areas that I can automate this? Um, one of the things I often recommend is that you create a SQL script, because if you have a nice long list and probably a Word document and you're following these steps, it's easy to miss a step and forget to hit a button. And if you do that, then once you let users in, there can be issues. And so I often will help clients write a SQL script and we automate as much as possible. And then the last thing for this um, area of LCS is <clears throat> service updates. All of us as the admins are having to update our system um, up to four times a year now, at least twice a year. So it's something that someone has to be managing and it usually falls to us. And if you haven't heard Microsoft change to four service updates a year and we have to, um, we can only pause one at a time and there's two windows that a service update can be applied now. And you have to, if you want to deploy all of a release, you have to do both of those 
pause both of those windows. And so this is something that I recommend that you have the service update calendar or the availability <laughs> website saved in your favorites and you check that because I will tell you Microsoft has changed those dates at different times. The other thing is after you finish a service update and you've paused your next service update is to have a planning meeting and think through, OK, now that I just finished this, when are the next service updates that I'm going to do in the system? When does it work in the calendar for our company? When are some of our slow times? When are times that we're really busy and I want to avoid and get those dates um, kind of penciled in? The other area that I wanted to talk about in LCS is the environment monitoring section. And I'm specifically going to talk about production, but this is an area in LCS that you have for all of your uh, Microsoft managed environments. And this is an area where, um, again, whether you set a reminder or a task on your calendar for once a week, every other week, once a month, I recommend um, some of these different areas that you go and look at to try to get ahead of any issues. What, um, what I want to help you do is find things and be able to resolve them bec before they become a fire, right? And so if you are in LCS on your production page, down at the bottom of the page is the environment monitoring link. And when you go in there, we have the activity tab. And I've called out four specific logs that I recommend you look at on a periodic basis. So the first is your error events. And so this would be, what are some of the errors that you might not get e be getting reports on? And again, I, I don't spend a lot of time here. I just kind of look at what's there and see if there's something that jumps out or if I see a lot of the same error and I decide I want to dig into that to try to get ahead of things. The other one is to look to see if you're having any crashes. Now that Dynamics is a web app. We we don't always hear about all the crashes that are happening. And um, if the batch is crashing, we might not be hearing about that. So we want to get ahead of this, look and see if anything is crashing, see if there's a common area where it's crashing. And if so, we work with our developers or create a case with Microsoft to dig into that and try to get ahead of that. The other thing is long running queries. Um, this can happen in any system. And so we want to look and see, hey, is there anything that is taking a long time that we see it show up multiple times within um, the date that range that we're looking at? And we look at, OK, do I maybe need an index? Do I need to involve the developer to go and look at that code? And then the last one is around deadlocks. So this is um, if you're having deadlocks in the system, you want to see if there's a pattern, if there's one area or hopefully not more than one where you're consistently getting deadlocks, you might want to go back and look at that area of the software and see, like, is there something data related? Is there a customization? You might even need to work with Microsoft on that. Now we're going to talk about Azure and some things you can be doing within Azure. Um, within Azure, we have application IDs. And again, this is often used for integrations. And so what we want to do is come in here, if you haven't done this already, and look at when your um, certificates might expire. And then set some sort of reminder before that time frame so that you can come out and update or actually create a new certificate and then go update your integration to use that new certificate. Because if they expire, all of a sudden your integration is not working. So go out and do that so that we don't have any system down <laughs> situations. And then the other thing in Azure that we can be doing is for those cloud hosted environments, those beasts can cost a significant amount of money if we just leaving, leave them running all the time. And so I definitely suggest that you think through when can we have those shut down and how do we automate that? So whether it's nightly or just for the weekend, we can come in, um, go to the VM, say auto shutdown, and say that we want it turned on and what time we want it to shut down. You can also automate the startup of those machines. That's not quite as simple. I've put some links um, 
for more information about that. Next, we want to talk about security. We know that cybersecurity is a big deal right now in our lives. Um, we're hearing about more and more hacks or data breaches, um, people who have ransomware attacks. We don't always hear about all of those, but they're happening. And we want to make sure that we're securing our environments. Microsoft is responsible for the most part for our um, production and Microsoft managed environments. But when it comes to the cloud hosted environments, that's on your infrastructure. And one of the things we're seeing is that a lot of people are having those cloud hosted environments where people are trying to get into those and trying to use the username and password or figure out what the username and password is and get into those. And so we want to secure, figure out ways to secure those environments. And in the links, I'll have an article that Microsoft wrote about their things they should they've recommended that you should think about when trying to secure those another thing that you can do is limit the number of users that are assigned to the sysadmin security role so there i usually recommend that you try to have only at most 10 percent of your user base have that sysadmin role because with that sysadmin role we can get to any data within the system and tied to that is our integrations. So anytime we have an integration, we should, well, most of them will have a application ID that we're using to manage that integration. And we set that up in Dynamics and we set a user tied to that integration. And that user is the security that's used to say what data can that integration get to. And by default, we find that a lot of people set that to admin and that lets you get access to all data. And so what we recommend is that you create a specific account and then you create custom security roles that have only access to the data that those integrations need. And finally, let's talk about what you should do for keeping on top of things and learning and you know things are always changing in this world. So I definitely um, recommend that if you haven't already that you join Yammer now called Viva. And here are some different channels, the Dynamics Lifecycle, the Finance Application and Platform Updates, and then the Unified Admin and Developer Experience are the specific um, channels that I stay on top of. You can post questions there. You can see what other people are posting and know that both Microsoft and other people in the community respond to those. The other thing is Tech Talks. So Tech Talks is um, presentations that Microsoft does on different topics related to Dynamics. And they're just a great way to learn more about the system and maybe what some of the new features. So for example, they recently did one on Copilot. So you could go and learn more about that. And then the last thing is um, we're, we're always changing, right? There's always new features. What things should we be watching out for? Um, if you have not heard, LCS is going away and we're moving to Power Platform Admin Center. That's gonna be a big change for us. So Microsoft has a few articles out there with some information. Do know that as we move closer to that going live, both Microsoft and us at Stone Ridge will be presenting you with multiple options to learn more and make sure that you feel comfortable with that because that will be your no tool. And then the other one um, is as of 10.0.39, Microsoft has an archiving option now that's in preview. I will tell you it's maybe not as robust as we would like, but now there's something. And so it's just another feature that you should go and look at because again, as we move to that admin center and more focus on capacity, we wanna make sure that we're archiving data in our systems so that we're lowering our total cost of ownership.